Welcome everybody to this session on collaboration, where we're going to be looking at the various different associations in individual countries around Europe. I'm delighted to welcome representatives from, in fact, eight associations, although you can only see seven people on the screen. Um, the associations are represented by, if you just like to put your hand up as I say your name again, uh, Simon Johnson is representing the ARP in the UK, the Association of Relocation Professionals. Um, Jeremy Bartou is representing the SNPRM, Syndicat National des Professionnels de la Relocation et de la Mobilité, and also FAR and MG, Fédération des Acteurs de la Relocation et de la Mobilité Globale. Only the French okay. could have two of the longest <laughs> names in history. <laughs> Uh, Eric Klitsch is representing ABRA from Belgium, the Association of Belgian uh, Relocation Agents. Sabine Beerlocher will be representing SARA, the Swiss Association of Relocation Agents. Guntram Maschmeyer will be representing D. Jura in Germany. Um, and Christian van Bremen will be representing Bremen, the Association yeah. of Relocation Professionals in the Netherlands. Um, and Madalena Michaeli will be rep representing AIR in Italy, the Association of Italian Relocation Companies. So those are, those are our speakers today. Um, however, before we go any further, I, I'm going to just start with a, to sort of explain a little about the sort of history of relocation associations around the world. Uh, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Worldwide ERC was the first association to be formed to represent the relocation industry back in the late 60s. In the early 80s, the Canadian Employee Relocation Council was formed in 1982. And the first European association was the Association of Relocation Professionals. In fact, I went to the inaugural meeting of the Association of Relocation Professionals and was originally on the board of the association and then went on to run it from 1987. We were followed by the French in 1995, um, or maybe slightly earlier. Um, when I heard the French were thinking of setting up an association, as a true British person, I sent a letter to them and suggested they might like to form a French chapter of the ARP. I was swiftly told that wouldn't be necessary. However, uh, once they were up and running, uh, it was in fact the SNPRM who had the idea to form EURA, and between the SNPRM and the ARP, EURA came into existence in 1998. Um, and I think I can safely say that all of the other associations were formed basically as a result of people meeting through EURA. Um, and so my first question, um, that I'm going to ask um, of, of those of you who I haven't mentioned already is um, why were you formed in your specific country? And the first person I'm going to ask that question to is Eric about Abra. A sound. Okay. Um, yes, so we created uh, uh, the Belgian Association back it all started in the late 90s. The Belgian Real Estate Association, which had obtained a professional legal recognition, started filing legal actions against relocation firms saying that uh, we were doing a real estate job without legal title. This uh, led the relocation companies to start talking to each other how to solve the problem, which in turn led to the creation of ABRA in 2001. And under the ABRA umbrella, members were able to negotiate with the real estate association and reach an agreement authorizing ABRA members to be exempt from holding a legal real estate title. So that's what really triggered uh, the creation of our association. Okay, thank you, Eric. And Sabine, how did SARA come about? Uh, Sarah came about because I met uh, Anne-Claude Lamblay at a Euro meeting and she had been in relocation for a very long time in Switzerland 
and she had had the idea of creating a, a, a local association because she knew people from the S&P RAM, et cetera, me too. And we both had this discussion saying, okay, we need a Swiss chapter of Eura. <laughs> In fact, it was really that. And we, we contacted all of the other relocation, as, uh, relocation company that we knew and it uh, was created. And uh, you were present at the, the first meeting. I when, was indeed. When the first nine companies that said, yes, it's a good idea, had a meeting all together to, to found the association. Uh, yeah, so that the association could be created. It was in Geneva. 2003. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, I remember um, fully being told that I, I had no right being there because I wasn't a Swiss, but as it happens, I am a Swiss, so I was fine. Yes. Anyway, uh, I'm going to ask that question to Christian um, from the Netherlands. Um, what happened? Why? Well, it's before my time, I have to be honest. I was on relocation in 2006. Um, already at that time, uh, and I do know that I think three companies, three relocation companies in the Netherlands just stuck their heads together and followed the example of uh, Eura and uh, the ARP in the UK and also I know that there were connections with uh, SARA in, um, in Switzerland. So the ARPN in the Netherlands was born in 2006 and it started with, I think, three relocation companies, whereas now we are about 14. And it's, it's always a matter of not inventing the wheel again. I mean, Eura is giving us a lot. So um, it's really about the, the local knowledge and the local connections with government bodies and all the um, mobility chain providers, actually. Thank you. And Madalena, the newest kid on the block, having been formed only recently. Why? Yeah, uh, well, 2020 actually, and uh, we decided to create the associations because we were the last ones. <laughs> 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 because now actually the idea to have an association was in the air since a long time, and maybe not many people know that uh, more than 20 years ago, together with Studio Paperini and Professional Rilo, we tried to create an association, but then for several reasons it didn't work. It didn't, uh, uh, it didn't work. So um, COVID, the pandemic, was the unfortunate event who brought us together around the virtual table. And we uh, then started to talk about all the COVID-related matters. And uh, we started for the first time to talk very frankly and openly and uh, to do things uh, and, and to, to speak about things which we were unable to do during the Eura conferences, for example, because as you know, people are always extremely busy. So from the COVID, um, matters, it was very natural to start talking about uh, having an association because we wanted to, um, to promote our business, we wanted to make uh, um, a, a dedicated and knowledgeable, knowledgeable um, uh, profession live and visible and different from improvised providers. Uh, because we wanted to be uh, united and then become stronger uh, towards uh, um, public authorities, first of all, but also in general um, towards all the third parties involved in the relocation present. We wanted to represent something and uh, to have a common goal rather than um, working, just looking at our own garden. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madalena. And Guntram, I, I should say that um, when we held the in initial meeting of Eura, uh, the one thing that was very apparent in that particular meeting in Paris was that the Germans didn't want to stick together, they wanted to be separate. So what happened to change that and why did de Eura come about? Sound Thanks for mentioning this again. Um, <laughs> we do have a quite, we do quite have a fragmented market in Germany, and um, you know it's a large market, um, and there's a variety of different companies around, with a variety of different backgrounds. But as you know, we've 
we've had some very active members, some very active German members in the Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, we quickly discovered that, um, similar to Madalena's um, impression, that we've had some very um, positive and proactive and productive talks during the Euro conventions. And um, we were quickly gathering that thought that we wanted to have that productive um, feel and that productive um, mood also installed within some German um, exchange. So we started to, um, to contact various companies and um, have engaged in a very productive and engaging um, discussion ever since, um, not creating an official um, association within Germany, but sort of like an unofficial one that is meeting regularly and also producing some very um, helpful outputs um, for all of the attendees. Thank you. Now, of course, um, associations um, are there to, to do things on behalf of members. And I was wondering um, if I could ask all, uh, all of you, with perhaps the exception of Madalena, because uh, they've only just literally formed, um, if you can say how your associations have worked effectively over the years, um, but, but uh, we will we'll come back to the last six months a little later on. Um, so I'm going to turn to Jeremy now and say, as far as SMPRM and Foreign MG is concerned, what have they achieved over the years um, and, you know, that you can share with us? Um, thanks, Ted. Uh, mainly three, three topics jump to mind. Uh, the first one will relate to what Eric, what Eric just said uh, regarding the, uh, the divide between um, relocation professionals and realtors. Uh, we had pretty much the same issue in France uh, as um, realtors in France must uh, obtain uh, what is called the carte T, which is the professional license to be a realtor. And the law uh, pertaining to realtors in France is particularly uh, not well written. Uh, which left uh, a big gap for, for us to be put in uh, as being relocation professionals. So there was much debate over the years on this topic. Uh, and and I'm, I'm glad to report that through the work of associations, uh, SNPRM mainly, uh, as, as it was the only existing body at the time, um, the carte T is not a requirement from our uh, perspective, which is very good, uh, since it uh, puts us in a in a situation, and I speak personally on on behalf of my company here, uh, not to be uh, seen as intermediaries who perceive commissions from um, renting properties to assignees, and and really that's a, that's a big plus from my perspective. Uh, on the same vein, we wouldn't be French if the relocation industry wasn't subsidized in a way. And in that sense, uh, there is a subsidy <laughs> that can cover part of the cost for mobility into France, uh, which is called MobiliPass. And, and um, in, in, in that department, both associations have been very uh, working very closely with the uh, French administration granting this subsidy in order to make sure that uh, it is open to both um, I would say large companies as well as smaller companies and that also uh, relocation companies but also um, and independent consultants can benefit from it which is wasn't was not the case uh, during the, the life of this subsidy the final topic would be uh, how we face new entrants into the market as an industry as it has been the case in the in the past few years uh, we've seen many new uh, players coming, whether they are private or public uh, actors, uh, or uh, whether they're not, they are, um, I would say, specialists of relocation or, uh, let's say, uh, people that do it on the side. Uh, and, and having strong associations that can bring a, <clears throat> a unified voice uh, with regards to this, um, these new entrants is very valuable uh, as uh, uh, someone in the market and having uh, a, strong, a strong stance on those new entrants uh, has been very, uh, very good from our perspective as well. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, now, perhaps uh, Simon, you could give us a bit of an insight into the ARP. Uh, with pleasure. Uh, I think there'll be sort of a common theme that will go for some of this. And the, the first thing I would add is just the general increasing awareness of the relocation industry. I think, um, as many of my colleagues here have just said, 
we often get lumped into the real estate market or the letting market, etc., and we're not. We're something very different. So I think there's three things I would like to highlight. One is just making sure we had a greater awareness uh, of us as an industry in the UK has been a driving factor, a common goal with Euro. And I think one of the best ways we demonstrated that is that we did a survey last year to actually evaluate what was the financial impact of us as a group on the UK economy. Uh, and just to sort of see how big a voice we actually have. And the results were spectacular uh, and really interesting. And the outcome was, as some of you may know, we have an impact on the UK economy of an excess of six billion pounds. Now that's substantial. Mm -hmm. So just to have that information for us as the ARP to say, well, we, are, we are an organization or group of companies, big and small, that has that big of impact, has led to many other opportunities opening up. And I'll say one of them is the fact that um, I'm delighted to say on behalf of ARP, I often go onto the BBC radio now to talk about what's going on in the industry and what we're seeing and where we're going. And this is all from the ARP trying to actually make sure we have a clear and understood voice. And I also say the third thing is that in the last few years in particular, we are seeing a wave of new legislation and rules and regulations coming in. So just a, a couple of obvious ones, which I think may be common with all of us, is things like we had the Right to Rent Act in the UK that came in in 2009, sorry, 2019. Um, which was actually just to make sure that everybody who comes into the UK was registered and their the passport was vetted and every landlord and agent has a responsibility. So what was the relocation? Uh, companies role on this so we had uh, a real big say in that and the second one is a right back up to date is we've got the money laundering rules that came in the European money laundering rules that, that they were introduced to the UK at the beginning of this year and they came in with a whimper the government was spectacularly unhelpful if I can be honest about explaining how this will work so we as an organization spent a lot of time and effort and uh, to actually make sure all our members understood what this meant and and how it actually impacted their day-to-day -day working so it's issues like that i would suggest have actually been central to to the arp recently thank you very much I, if i can just add being as though i've been around with the arp for quite a long time uh, that one of the things that we did from the word go was training um, and we uh, actually developed um, a sort of fundamentals of relocation program for people starting in the industry back in, I think the first one we did might have been even 1989. And effectively from that, uh, it's the root of all training coming through to, to Euro and other organizations. It's, that's where we started with that. And one of the most regular trainings we've done apart from that particular one has been the legal aspects of letting. Well, that's something that's unique to the UK because the law is unique to the UK and it's something that still happens today. And I have been in many a uh, session on the legal aspects of letting and seeing people's faces go white, especially when they introduced legislation relating to uh, furniture catching fire and that kind of thing and the sorts of uh, penalties that people have. I seem to remember the entire room thought they were going to be jailed. Uh, but luckily, in, you know, these things pass. But uh, you're quite right. It's, it's about doing, it's very, it's very specific, but it's, it's about doing stuff for your country. Um, okay, so uh, Christian, what is, what, is, um, what is ARPN proud of? What are we proud of? Um, well, it, you can definitely say that we're not in the market as long as you guys in the UK, so you've been uh, the association in the UK since 1986, I see. There's still a lot to do for us in the Netherlands, I would say. Um, I think that we are proud of our, uh, about uh, the number of members that we have now in the Netherlands. You could say that we have, we really represent the relocation industry in the Netherlands, and they are the bigger, uh, the bigger players in the market. Uh, there is a really good relationship with the government bodies. So the Immigration Association here in, um, in, in the Netherlands and uh, also with the Real Estate um, um, Association. So in the past few years, we've really built on that. And we've even uh, restructured the ARPN. We are doing different types of meetings nowadays. So it's far more about sharing information also from, because it, this is a chain of, of uh, providers that work together in the mobility industry. 
And we need to learn from everyone. All those little details will make us as an industry stronger in the Netherlands, I would think. Excellent. And um, Sabine, what's been happening in Switzerland? Well, we've done a little bit of almost everything that has been mentioned, maybe a little bit less in terms of lobbying at a political level, because Switzerland being a direct democracy, it's automatically done in a way. Um, but we did, we have done some training. Uh, we, I mean, several training also about lease and things like that. What we do also is, for example, at the moment, we are translating the general rules and condition, the 2020 new general rules and condition for Switzerland for the rental agreement in English, because nobody in Switzerland is officially translating them except the relocation company. So Sarah is doing it for its members so that it will help them and, and those kind of things, you know, simplifying the life of our members so that they don't have each and every one of them have to do something that everybody will have to do. So this is also something that, that will help. And uh, discussing, well, we don't have so much problem with real estate agency. That wasn't a major problem. Frankly, we didn't have that. Uh, but we tried to lobby also with, the, in general, with the multinational company group, because in Switzerland we have uh, association of the multinational company and we have done things with them for example or with expatriate groups etc as an association we can contact them because it looks less like a like trying to sell, sell them something yes mm -hmm. exactly so we have had some some join event and things like that which were really interesting so it gives an opportunity for our member to go to event with HR and things like that without being themselves directly you know, as a, as a company there, but as a member of Sarah. So that helps also for that. Well, that's very good. That's a, something new. Um, and Eric, Abra. Uh, so, well, the association has, you know, mostly served as a mean of discovering that we had much more in common between uh, relocation than uh, companies than, uh, than we originally thought, and that we had much more to gain from joining forces and sharing experiences rather than hide and fear from each other, which used to be the case uh, uh, before there was an association and before we started talking. Uh, and besides protecting us from uh, legal actions from uh, a real estate association, uh, we have grown our association because many organizations uh, uh, really liked to be near the relocation world and nowadays 75 percent of the of the membership of the association is affiliate members such as uh, um, short-term rentals uh, banks insurance companies international schools uh, uh, you know furniture rentals all of these are are among a you know form actually now 75 percent of our membership and one of the things we have uh, uh, achieved that has really uh, pleased our members has been to be able to cut into the famous Belgian uh, red tape and obtaining some uh, privileged processes for relocation companies for, uh, for example, for obtaining a residence permit in certain towns. Uh, we have now special channels reserved only for uh, relocation companies and, and mm saving a lot of consultants' time and, and clients' time, which, is, uh, uh, which makes everybody happy. Excellent. And Guntram? Well, first of all, what I would like to stress is that I am quite proud that we've been able to achieve a self or to achieve to generate a self-sustaining meeting procedure and exchanging procedure amongst our members in Germany. Even, you know, as I said, we aren't necessarily able to rely on a professional um, body within Germany, but we have been able to generate a self-sustaining process that is actually helping um, all of our members and attendees to benefit uh, from the knowledge and the insights that are shared. And um, likewise to um, the others, real estate topics have been a large uh, point of interest in our uh, previous meetings. But we've also quickly progressed to generate more value and insight in terms of compliance and, and immigration topics. And um, as we are facing currently 
you know, in a, in a on and off situation, some more restraints in terms of how to employ freelance agents, for example. Um, we are now also um, extending our insights and thoughts to um, legal support for all of the members um, on a, um, a free will basis, but also testing the waters, whether we can actually provide for some action in terms of lobbying amongst the German authorities um, for the insights that we generate and for the um, challenges that we face um, should this freelance, for example, this freelance topic uh, come up again um, and turn against us. So yeah, a lot of things that I am quite proud of that this body of uh, members has been able to achieve in the past. Okay, well, I'm now going to come round you again and ask you if there's any significant uh, successes that your associations have achieved. Um, Simon, ARP, anything particularly significant? Uh, yes, I, I would say quite a lot. I, I just want to echo something that Eric said earlier, which I, I just thought was such a good comment, and that is that we've got more in common than not. And I, I've, I've really sort of, that's been driven home in the last six months or so uh, since the COVID arrived. It's just actually how much we actually want to share some commonality and how much we are willing to actually support each other. And it's, it's not something that may be obvious if we didn't have groups like, like this to be able to sort of pull that, that, that safe space to, to talk. But I just want to say that actually uh, a, a large number of us have really been proactive recently. Um, we've actually, as some may know, we've been lobbying to our local MPs and to Parliament. But we haven't been doing this individually. We've been doing this as a group. We've been actually um, going through talking with Tad and all the members. Everybody's invited um, to put their pennies worth in. We are actually working with somebody at the moment to try and see if we can get the parliament to recognize us as a, as a group, as an industry, and actually recognize a few things that will be very helpful, not, not just to the UK relocation industry, but to all employers uh, within the UK. And it sort of makes me realize just how big an impact we as a group, uh, whether in the UK or across Europe, can actually do. And it's not actually held back by anything other than our imagination and willingness to do it. And it's so far, I'm very impressed with what we've done. We've actually written to the parliament, we've written to the chancellor, we've got MPs talking to us. We try to recognize what we're trying to achieve and what we want to try and outcome, have as an outcome. We're doing more in training, we're doing more compliance, uh, but it's brought a lot of different companies who are natural competitors together uh, to actually make sure that we improve the world for everybody. And it's, it's an amazing outcome. And I have to say, if we can ignore the small detail of COVID for a moment, if the outcome of this is that actually it brings us closer together, uh, it's an amazing outcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Jeremy, what about in France, most significant successes? Well, uh, I'm not going to start with the success, but what I think is the opposite of success, uh, and that's the fact that I'm representing two syndicates, <laughs> two, two bodies <laughs> at the same time. The fact that um, uh, there was um, a, de a deviation between the two uh, from my perspective at least since i i entered the industry after after the after the fact uh is uh, less than a success let's say uh, hopefully it can it can change someday but uh, uh this um echoes to to what simon just said and uh, it, mainly in the sense that uh, um we we came together nonetheless uh in, in the fact that um, we support as groups uh independent consultants that's the and that's the, the way the market is set up in France. Uh, we have many freelan freelancers and, and both bodies do provide tremendous support to those uh, in, in training uh, with our <laughs> own uh, Fondamentaux de la Relocation <laughs> program that uh, you, you will recognize that. Uh, and the fact that uh, we, we can come together on big topics, big issues, uh, such as COVID, obviously, uh, but also in bringing a, a political voice as well. And we, we actually took a page from, uh, um, from Simon's playbook and the ARP in uh, contacting our ministry and, and going, um, I would say, uh, 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 to lengths of lobbying, although uh, we we do not have success yet. Uh, hope is great <laughs> that uh, that we can uh, we can get a status out of it, and we can also uh, get a better uh, recognition and and financial recognition from from our government uh, in the midst of the of the pandemic. So successes there are, and success successes will come as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, Guntram, anything particularly significant in Germany? Uh, <laughs> I, 
would like to echo, uh, I'm too diligent on this muting, I think. Uh, I would like to echo the, um, the part that um, this is now getting, you know, uh, um, to a much closer relationship between the individual members. And, you know, what I view, if I, if I take it a bit more from, uh, from a helicopter perspective, what I view as the most um, successful outcome is that we've actually passed the stage of information gathering and are now actively entering the stage of um, individual support and, um, and you know and, and a very um, focused support for our members and you could see this you know with the recent times that we've had we've you know quickly emerged with um, helping groups quickly emerged with helping forums for for people you know questioning about employment about compliance you know with new regulations coming up and I think this would be, to my opinion, the um, the most beneficial part that we've passed that stage from gathering and and getting closer together and being friendly on you know on an exchange level, but also progressing into a proactive um, um, body that is actually able to significantly improve um, the, um, the individual members' situation um, at a certain stage. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, Eric? Well, as I mentioned earlier, our, our most significant successes have been that, that agreement, uh, that original agreement with the real estate body and, and uh, you know, managing to, to get some uh, privileged processes for our members. And also, like Sabine is doing in Switzerland, we do provide also our members with regularly updated uh, least translation for the various regional laws that make us having different uh, uh, real estate laws in the different uh, region and different type of lease agreements. So uh, we, we keep our members with really updated uh, legal, legal translation in English so that they can provide that uh, to their clients. Excellent. And um, uh, Sabine? Yes, so just to be precise, in fact, the translation that we're doing at the moment is for one canton in Switzerland. We have 26, so we have 26 general rules and conditions in Switzerland, so we have to keep up to date, believe me. So it's a lot of work, but those are the kind of things, yes, that we, I think that it's really the level of dialogue that we have today. I think we always had a really good information exchange in Switzerland, but today I think we can say that most of the members of SARA are even friends. So it, went, it, it goes really way beyond just being not only, well, first we were competitors, then we were, you know, cooperating on different things. And now you, have, you can see that some people that have been member of SARA for a very long time, they exchange information that go way deeper, et cetera, uh, to, to the point of, of almost lobbying. The other things that I'm really proud of is that SARA has members that, that are super, super small, tiny local company in one, one city, as well as the big RMC that are our member. And for a country as small as Switzerland, I think it's a, it's a great thing. And we have 40 members, 42 members in total, half of them being relocation company and therefore full member, the other half being affiliates. And we have major banks and things like that also that are members. So, so yes, um, the, the, the representation of all kinds of relocation company, all size, and uh, the, the, the friendship and, and how much we, we achieve together today. Yes. And um, finally on this one, uh, Christian. Yeah, I, I can agree to what Sabine is saying. For us, it's the same. We, the members have sort of moved beyond the fact that we are competitors amongst uh, in the Netherlands. We have moved beyond that. So it's a matter of sharing information. Uh, and as an example, the G GDPR in 2018, I think it was, um, we had a lawyer that helped us as an association with the contracts that we needed to draft and all of the members just participated and shared the information and we arrived at really good contracts. Same goes for the general terms and, and conditions for delivering our services. So that is something that we, we did as a group. Um, last week, that was really nice. Um, one of the members mentioned that they were working on an RFP 
And the client had said that the requisition was membership of ARPN in the Netherlands. Otherwise, you cannot give your prices. So I think that's good. I think recognition like that is, is priceless. Yeah. And uh, I like to see it. Um, and it has been, you know, it does appear in RFPs that people are members of Euro sometimes, which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually the Sabine's point about people becoming friends is true everywhere. It's true within individual associations, within countries. It's true within Euro, across the world. Um, you know, all of you have been to Euro conferences. You've all met people. Um, you're all friends with people in all sorts of weird and wonderful places. And I think that's the, 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 the thing is, is that as an industry, uh, it, it, we're not enormous. We're not a huge industry in terms of personnel, but we are a, a very big industry in terms of communication and being, with, being able to communicate with each other. And, um, and this is a very unfortunate turn of events that we're all sitting here doing this session on Zoom rather than sitting um, in a conference room somewhere where it should be in Seville um, and, and doing this uh, in Seville or somewhere like that. It would be, it would be so much uh, better. But, you know, we do what we have to do and we realise uh, that Zoom's not perfect when people don't turn their sound on or whatever happens uh, or there are glitches or you lose people. Uh, but this is this we are here doing this now communicating it's fantastic now obviously uh, COVID-19 has had an effect um, on what has been going on um, so uh, I'm going to just come round you and say in what way do you think um, Jeremy that COVID-19 has changed the landscape well Covid, as as all crises, is um, a catalyst for for change. So, uh, I, I think it's really been a, a driver in in um, the changes that were to come or that uh, were overdue in our industry, uh, such as digitization, um, virtual service delivery, and 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 in that sense, I think um, our associations um, working with members uh, in, in putting on best practices and, and putting on recommendations uh, for members and for uh, people on the ground was really a, a driving force in, in uh, cushioning the blow of the, of the crisis to some extent. Um, also also uh, them working together uh, in, a, in a similar fashion uh, towards recognition with our government uh, is, I think, the, the right direction for, for both associations. And... Um, and I, I mean, yeah, the the common enemy, the common threat, uh, is is the thing that will bring people together in that sense. So that's uh, that's very much how I I want to see the the crisis so far. Uh, let's see what what it brings out of good <laughs> out of uh, of our industry in France. I'm sure it will. Um, and Sabine. Sorry, I didn't think you would ask me right away, so I was on mute. Um, so, well, in Switzerland, what, what I have seen and what I have heard really from our member is mainly that it, it something similar than what Jeremy was saying is that people had to change some of their services. And several of our member, they thought about, okay, how can I adapt? How can I do something a little bit differently? How can I be more online, more proactive? And in a way, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> I think that they adapted a little bit more maybe to millennials and to what the new generation of expat are, uh, are expecting from a relocation company and those kind of services. And maybe the COVID helps for that. And finally, yes, it was, uh, it was difficult for everyone, but in the end, it wasn't as bad as we thought when we discussed it in April. At this stage, it's okay. <laughs> At this stage, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. We've so far, this... so good. So far, yes. so good. <laughs> if we got this far, hopefully we'll survive to the end. And Simon? Uh, yes, it's. I want to echo some of Jeremy's comments. I think he sums it up pretty well. But I'd just like to add a few things on top of that. Uh, and one is going back to the ARP and the sort of safe space that that brings and the closeness that we all have as members is that what we have seen since COVID is that we are willing to share a little bit more what we're seeing on the ground. This is not giving away sensitive information. It's just trying to spot the trends 
Uh, and we've actually having a lot of members actually talk to each other in ways that we've never done before to actually see what is the underlying aspect, what's happening here, what's happening there. And by pulling that together, we get a much clearer picture. So as a result, I would say that we are uh, also in the UK making a lot of changes, a lot of modifications. I would say, you know, we as a business, but I think most of us are moving into a far more digital space and, and using things like virtual viewings a lot more than we have ever had before. So we're seeing all that come in. And I think that's going to stick. I think uh, a lot of this is going to be a, a lasting impact of, of the virus. But I will bring it back to the ARP and actually saying is that uh, I also suggest that the, the willingness to share general knowledge in a way that we haven't been able to do before is going to be a massive boost for this industry overall, because we will be able to deliver perhaps a better service to our clients, to the assignees, and improve the overall visibility of this industry. So I'm an optimistic person at heart. So the COVID is not doing anybody any favours here in the UK. It's, I think, famously perhaps been a, um, one of the worst affected. But I think there is something good that's going to come out of it, and I think AIP can harness it in a big way. Thank you very much. And Guntram? Um, yes, in, in the part I'm echoing my, my predecessors here. I mean, uh, COVID-19 has certainly forced us to end the industry, to rethink some of our models and, and how we approach uh, business uh, in total. Um, but, you know, I, I am also keen on, on pointing out that this industry, be it small or large, has always been famous for adapting to the needs of our clients. And, uh, and now is the time where we are more than ever challenged to adapt and to, and to, to rethink our models. And at the same time, we do, and that this is also in, to, in tune with what um, my predecessors have said, at the same time, we definitely feel that the industry members are getting closer together and are even more willing to share about compliance issues, about issues on employment, but also about issues on, you know, how to progress with authorities um, or individual clients, you know, without sharing any sensitive information. But um, still, I think as, you know, as a great, you know, underlying theme, you know, we need to adapt more than ever. We've always had to adapt. And we now uh, are now facing a much more closer alignment amongst our members and um, certainly much more willingness as well to, um, to engage in this as, you know, together. Thank you very much. And Eric? Uh, well, uh, you know, one of the major changes, obviously our meetings now uh, uh, with our members have to be online, just like for Eura and for everybody else. Uh, but mostly it has reduced the number of international transfers and all our members, uh, uh, both relocation companies and affiliates are, are, you know, severely suffering from that. And uh, so our quarterly networking meetings uh, are a major reason for, our, for members to join the association. And now that these are not possible, we've had to look at new ways of offering value for, uh, for the membership of the association. So uh, we, we speak a lot with our members. As of this month, we are now adding a monthly online session for the members on, on various topics, obviously immigration updates with linked with the travel restrictions, uh, you know, um, you know, more and uh, trying to offer more and more uh, uh, piece of services to our members. Basically, it's what we are uh, doing, trying to do as an association right now. Thank you very much, Eric. And Christian. Yeah, uh, I want to come back to what Jeremy said, and this is uh, that this COVID situation is indeed a catalyst for change, because you really have to rethink on how you're delivering your services. Um, the, the personal uh, interaction or the personal meetings are becoming more difficult. So how are you going to perform a, a home finding uh, service? All of those practical things. We are having a call with all of our members uh, on October 1. We planned for that to be a face-to-face -face meeting, which is not happening. So it's all going to be online. Um, and we have set this as, as a discussion point. How are you, gonna, how are you providing your, your home finding services? And obviously, with the situation changing on a daily basis, um, we'll just have to go with that. Thank you. Yeah. And Madalena, um, apart from the catalyst to form air, um, how has COVID-19 changed the landscape in Italy? 
Um, well, uh, as I said, our uh, association was born with COVID. So this was the very first thing we were discussing about. So new business model. And as everybody, we uh, were discussing about the virtual tour, virtual house hunting, estate agents were uh, very well are still uh, organizing and making possible virtual visits, etc. But as Sabine said, I think that generally speaking, virtual tours, virtual housing tours uh, are probably a better uh, match uh, younger uh, assignees and millennials. Um, there are countries like Sweden, for example, where I was told that generally speaking, the um, expatriates getting there are very, very young. So, uh, virtual tours is something that they have been done since ever. So it was not the COVID who brought them to uh, change the way they were delivering these type of services. Uh, in Italy, it's also a matter of uh, a type of assignees. Maybe, um, at least personally, we were having a lot of families, a lot of VIP. So even if we were available to deliver virtual tours, actually a more traditional service face-to-face -face accompanied on finding was still required. The people preferred to wait rather than choosing a property uh, during a, a virtual on finding. So we were ready and really as an association discussing about this new business model. But as a matter of fact, as soon as COVID, the, the, sorry, the lockdown was over, uh, the discussion was everybody wanted to have the unfinding, but then how, would, how many people in a car? Uh, how many people visiting a property? One person per car, no, two people. And then uh, and the, the, the face mask and the, the, the thing to cover uh, shoes. If the property uh, was, there were people, there, there were other tenants, then the, the, the association of the state agents didn't allow you to visit it because people living there didn't want to have people arriving from outside to visit their property. So it became even more complicated than having a virtual tour in a way. Now it seems that during the summer that we were returning to a sort of normality uh, with the normal home finding. But now, I don't know, but with, with, with the current situations where every country is getting different and unfortunately worse from a COVID point of view, Every country, every government is uh, uh, deciding its own protection measures. I think that it's, it's getting even more challenging to plan how to move and what to do. Thank you very much, Madalena. I, I did hear one story, um, which was that a, a member reported that they had a number of issues where uh, assignees had decided to go home uh, at the beginning of the COVID crisis and they packed their suitcases and left the house and taken the keys. And then, <laughs> so then the relocation company had to somehow or another get hold of a set of keys um, in order to clear out the assignee's stuff, the rest of the assignee's stuff to have it sent home. Um, and that was proving quite difficult. So COVID has, has kicked up a few challenges. Now, I want to banish COVID from the conversation and I want to move on to the final thing I want to know is where do you see your associations in five, ten years' time? I'm going to start with Sabine this time. Um, I hope that the association will be really able to be recognised by the different uh, local authorities because in some canton, we have some really close contact with them and we have a direct line with immigration, a direct line for some other things, etc. And in some other canton, it's like we don't exist or a member don't exist, etc. And it's and it's a problem. So in a country that is <laughs> super small like Switzerland, but it has 26 different government. Well, 27, if you count the federal one also. <laughs> so it's, uh, I hope that we will be able at least for the let's say the 10, 12 cantons, well, most of the expatriates are going to really create a direct 
dialogue with the local authorities. Mm, that sounds excellent. And uh, Christian, what about the Netherlands? Yeah. So uh, Simon was saying, and I made a few notes, because obviously we are 10 years behind you or 20 years behind you, so we need to develop into the future. The awareness of the industry, um, we all know with, uh, with Brexit and the European Medicines Agency coming to Amsterdam, I think we as ARPN missed that opportunity to be in the picture of the government and that they should have come to us to talk about who is going to guide all of these 900 assignees to the Netherlands. So we sort of missed that opportunity. I don't think we want that again. Not sure if ever such a situation will occur again, but I think that does set the ambition uh, for what we in the Netherlands want to achieve for the ARPN. Thank you. And Eric, what about uh, Abra? Uh, well, I, I do fear a further reduction in the number of our full members because like, like in the past year, there, I think there will be more mergers and acquisitions within the, within the relocation world. But uh, uh, all in all, all those years of continuous dialogues among uh, uh, all the relocation companies and all our affiliate members, it will likely continue and, and enable us to obtain more successes and event advantages for our members uh, and, and members which have over time uh, 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 become friends and, you know, for, for many of them. So I think this will continue to grant the success of the association. Thank you very much. And Guntram, what about de Jura in 10 years? That's a good question. Um, I think if we look back for the last 10 years, uh, we've made a rapid progress in terms of exchange and continuous um, involvement. Um, and we can also see that now, you know, in Germany, but also in the entire industry, there is a generation change coming upon us and has already been. And um, if we look in 10 years ahead, um, I would envision that this generation change also involves a different kind of involvement uh, with uh, organizations like Euro or the de Euro. And um, my hope would be that we would have a much stronger um, bond amongst the members, possibly even leading to uh, an official organization um, supporting that bond, um, but certainly connected to the change of generations and the um, adaptation to the current and future um, environments. Thank you, Guntram. And Madalena, what about air? Um, well, uh, we want to be where ARP is today. So I want to be Simon. You are also 34 years ahead. So in 10 years, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, well, of course, first of all, I hope that we will be more members. Uh, please just me uh, just mention the, uh, the other four companies. We are just five founding members, uh, which are um, Principal Relocation, A to Z Relocation, uh, MP, um, uh, Immigration. I, well, um, you, Professional Relocation. Yeah, Professional Relo and uh, uh, Studio Paperini, sorry. Um, so, to, 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 to be uh, bigger but stronger, first of all, for us, lobbying at an institutional level is very uh, important. So, I hope that we will have succeeded in that and uh, to have um, more cooperation between us, between uh, the members. So, um, uh, to, to, to move as i said even before to, to have reached this helicopter view moving from a uh, thinking um of 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 myself model to a larger um and more strategic uh, common view uh, thanks to the uh, cooperation and best practices i think that and training training for um all the uh, associates so i think that that would we could be satisfied if in 10 years we'd be able to reach these goals. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Simon? Oh, I, I, I love to have a long term goal. So I think there's about three or four things here which uh, I believe quite 
adamant that we can do. Uh, and the first one is for the relocation industry to be seen as a major industry sector on its own. So we actually are fully recognised and understood by, by the UK government or by any other industry sector you care to uh, talk about. That would then allow us to actually be able to promote change and support change to the highest level. So you, you're part of the voice, you are you're heard or you're contributing to it at the highest levels, whichever we need talking about, whether it's government or whether it's real estate market, etc. If you can do that, you'll then be uh, approached by the media uh, and other organisations that want to hear what you have to say on something. They will like your viewpoint on something. So therefore, that will be considered at a much earlier stage. So as a discussion is taking place, as you're seeing in the UK, on many things, you have government bodies or institutions that will be asked for the opinion. Why aren't we? So we should be part of that as well. And the last, but perhaps the most important, is to really make sure that we improve every member's profile and their skill sets. So if we can actually achieve that as well, so that everybody's uh, overall skill sets and ability to actually provide the service is dramatically improved in 10 years' time, then everything I just said before should come as standard. Thank you, Simon. And Jeremy, finally. Well, thanks for leaving me uh, answering the last because every, everything, everything they said, that's going to be my response. I, I mean, uh, there, there's everything in, in, in um, those, those responses that I want for our associations. But um, if, if I may be a little quirky, uh, my goal would be to have only one, uh, not two associations in 10 years time. Uh, that's personal. And, and obviously uh, bringing visibility, bringing uh, support for independent actors in our in our sector, I think is is are the, the two most uh, important things that I would see for for both associations. Thank you very much, and uh, it's it's very interesting that although you've all given different answers in many respects, they're along the same lines. And I think that the point about this session is to show that associations work in individual countries, and where there are people or members of Europe out there. Um, in countries where they have no in-country representation, that maybe they should be thinking about forming associations, uh, whether they be um, um, legally established or informal in the, in the case of de jure, it doesn't make any difference. It's an opportunity for people to get together. It's an opportunity for people to share things and to make their businesses better. Um, 34 years ago, when we first got together to talk about the ARP, it was only because 10 people in the room um, would have a discussion. And we were lucky enough that um, uh, the fact that we were thinking of starting an association was picked up um, by the Sunday Times, I think it was, and also a very well-known uh, magazine in the UK. And um, a couple of articles were printed and said that we were you know, thinking of forming an association. And when we had our inaugural meeting, we were expecting about 50 people, and there were 104 in wow. the room. Wow. Because there were a lot of very small organisations, but the one thing that has happened over the years, and this has happened everywhere, is the mergers, the acquisitions, um, the gathering together, the strengthening of organisations, and I think that, again, is something associations do help to strengthen their members. And we do all sorts of things to help members and we try and solve issues. Um, and currently, um, Eura is looking into trying to create a professional indemnity policy that works for everybody. But this, that is something we, Eura, can do, but we can't do stuff on a national le level. It's up to you guys and your organisations to do that. And I thank you very much indeed for participating this afternoon. And um, I'm now going to say, well, I'm going to ask you all to say goodbye and uh, the session will come to an end. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye